I think the, the general attitude is like, he's good, but you know, white rappers don't work. Despite the skepticism, the Slim Shady LP would sell upwards of 4 million copies. Though Eminem had spent years pursuing success, he found himself unprepared for the incessant crush of stardom. One minute, I'm on stage rapping in front of 30 people, and the next minute, I'm on stage rapping in front of 30,000 people. And it became a lot for me to deal with, you know? And being recognized in public and not being able to go to places that I used to go to, or go back to the same places without being fucked with. People would see me like I wasn't Marshall anymore. Well, look, it's Eminem on the court. Nah, dude, you know me. Pass me the ball. Shut up. In late 1999, while still on the road promoting the Slim Shady LP, Eminem began penning the songs that would become his next album, the Marshall Mathers LP. People to love me, people to hate me. But it's the evil that made me this backstab and deceitful and shady. His objective was to craft a lyrical up yours for anyone and everyone who'd ever done the rapper wrong. I'm not gonna let nobody get the best of me. I'm not no gonna let anybody get the last word. You can't outsmart a smart ass. I have to outsmart everyone or I lose. Next, an English angel brings out the devil in M. Like, your picture on my wall, like, this is about an obsessed fan. That's all I kept thinking. When Ultimate Albums returned. Yeah, what up, Detroit? Oh, no, big slim dog, 80 pound ball, what? six inch long. Back up. In late 1999, less than one year after provoking America with the Slim Shady LP, 27-year-old Detroit rapper Eminem began writing a vengeful response to his detractors. What if he's right? I'm just a criminal, making a living off of the world's misery. What in the world gives me the right to say what I like and walk around flipping the bird? But as M scribbled scathing new verses, the world wondered aloud if the Motor City Maniac was destined for the one-hit bin. All right, you did it one time. Let's see if it's real. A lot of people thought, okay, well, we heard all the little jokes, we heard all the little punchlines. That's not gonna happen on the second album. He said it. He's so crazy. <laughs> While M toured the globe in promotion of the Slim Shady LP, a litany of hip-hop producers cooked up beats for what would become the Marshall Mathers LP. Among them was Mark James, a.k.a. the 45 King. While watching TV one night, the 45 King stumbled upon the song Thank You in a commercial for the movie Sliding Doors. I was actually doing bells or doing something sitting on the bed watching it, and then, um, my tea gun cold, I'm wondering why not. I said, wow, that's kind of hot. The 45 King didn't recognize the angelic voice of English Chanteuse Dido, but he knew the track was begging for rhymes. And I taped it. I took it downstairs in the basement, I looped it up out of the bass line and drum tracks. He quickly ushered it off to Interscope Records. They passed the tape on to Eminem. Seeing the vision, like, in what Dido was saying, like, her words, like, instantly put me there. Like, your picture on my wall, like, this is about an obsessed fan. Like, that's all I kept thinking. Dear Slim, I wrote you, but you still ain't calling. I left my cell, my pager, and my home phone at the bottom. M spun Dido's nostalgic love letter into a caustic warning against taking his rhymes too seriously. But what's the said about you like the teacher is too? I say that shit just clown is all. Come on, how the f is you? He called the song Stan. He stepped outside and he took a look in. And he gave us all a look in. To hey, what it feels like to be the fan. It's been six months and still no word. I don't deserve it. I know you got my last two letters. I wrote the addresses on them perfect. What it feels like to be the person was being admired. Why are you so mad? Try to understand that I do want you as a fan. And he did it simultaneously. I even got a tattoo with your name across the chest. Anybody who lives and breathes for someone else who entertains is taking it too far and probably has something mentally wrong with them, make them do something fucked up. Shut up, bitch, I'm trying to talk. Hey, Slim, that's my girlfriend screaming in a drunk, but I just slit her throat. I just tied her up. See, I ain't like you. Cause if she suffocates, she'll suffer more. Then she'll die too. 
Well, gotta go. I'm almost at the bridge now. Oh, I'm a guy. I'm about to do this now. Fan obsession was one obvious byproduct of Eminem's sudden fame. Thank you. But the toll was far more personal elsewhere. Oh, look at that baby girl. His one-year marriage to wife Kim, mother to his daughter Haley, was disintegrating. When longtime collaborators, the funky bass team, presented M with an elegant new beat, he promptly penned the definitive anti-love letter to his bride. Sit down, bitch, you move again, I'll beat the out of you. He listened to the track, wrote the lyrics immediately. It, it made him, it gave him that, that angry feel. Look at your husband now! I said look at him! It was, uh, it was quite intense to see the passion he had. Uh, it was freaky. Get the f away from me! Don't touch me! I hate you! I just pictured her in my face and me being able to scream at her like that and, and you know, really tell her how I felt. The song would rank as the darkest of M's new material a gruesome, vicarious voyage into the Mather's volatile private life. Now shut the f*** up and get what's coming to you! I think my jaw hit the ground when I heard that the first time. He's talking about killing his wife. Who don't feel like that sometimes? You know what I'm saying? He just was crazy enough to write a song about it. The song Kim was tracked during a rare respite from the whirlwind promotional campaign for the Slim Shady LP. <laughs> Then, in November of 1999, Eminem jumped the Atlantic for a series of gigs in Europe. He found a pot of inspirational gold in Amsterdam. For some reason, you know, thoughts kept popping into my head. And uh, the entire time while I was there, um, did drugs and wrote. Okay, no drugs. But I wrote a lot. While Em inhaled the Amsterdam atmosphere, the beat-making process carried on back in the States. Em got a phone call from California. Why? It was Dr. Dre blasting a new cut. He actually was on the phone telling me he was going to send me some beats. And I actually had the track playing in the background. And he was like, yo, what is that? And I was like, put the phone in the speaker a minute. And he played it for me. And he was like, what's that? I got all right, send me that track. He sent it to me, and I wrote a song the next day. Atop Dre's quirky beat, M authored a drugged up bloodbath for those suggesting fame would soften his blows. They said I can't rap about being broke no more. The title cut right to the chase. Kill you. The song Kim had already proved no one was safe from M's vengeance. In Kill You, he kept it in the family, carrying out a lyrical rape of his mother, who was often the target of his rage. Shut up, it's causing too much chaos. Just bend over and take it like a okay, ma? He had already been in the media talking about his mother, all the different problems they're having, but on this song, he's talking about raping his mother. He's talking about killing his mother. Don't mess with me, I'll kill you, you know? And I was... I couldn't believe he was saying this. I'm gonna be another rapper dead for popping off at the mouth with... Eminem headed back to the States and promptly hit several studios. In Detroit, he worked with the Funky Bass Team. And in Los Angeles, he recorded with Dre and his partner, Melman. By February of 2000, Eminem had a 16-track arsenal in place and was ready to launch it at those who'd done him wrong. You never heard of a mind as perverted as mine. I just fed off of the energy that, that negative people gave me you know, and took it and, and basically, I guess, threw it back in their face. What do I think of success? It sucks. Too much stress and stress. Confident his new set would eclipse the Slim Shady LP, Eminem eagerly submitted his new album to Interscope Records in March of 2000. Label honcho Jimmy Iovine heard an album one song short of a masterwork. This album had a, it was a real growth from the first album and that it had a slope to it and and it got real dark bing, bing, bing. so i thought we needed something lighter and not funnier but lighter to introduce the record to kind of get people into it <laughs> <laughs> 